Welcome everybody to Deep Learning. So today we want to look into further common practices and in particular in this video we want to discuss architecture selection and hyperparameter optimization. And you know nothing in, in machine learning is exact, right? Remember the test data is still in the vault. We are not touching it. However, we need to set our hyperparameter somehow and as you've already seen there's an enormous amount of hyperparameters. You have to select an architecture, a number of layers, number of nodes per layer, activation functions, and then you have all the parameters in the optimization, the initialization, the loss function, and many more. The optimizers still have options like the type of gradient descent, momentum, learning rate decay, batch size. In regularization, you have different regularizers, a one and a two loss, batch normalization, dropout, and so on. You want to somehow figure out all the parameters for those different kinds of procedures. Now let's choose an architecture and a loss function. The first step would be to think about the problem and the data. How could features look like? What kind of spatial correlation do you expect? What data augmentation makes sense? How will the classes be distributed? what is important regarding the target application. Then you start with simple architectures and loss functions and of course you do your research. Try well-known models first and foremost. They are being published and there are so many papers out there. Hence there is no need to do everything yourself. One day in the library can save hours, weeks and months of experimentation. Do the research, it will really save you time. Often they don't just publish the paper, but in very good papers it's not just the scientific result, but they also share the code, sometimes even data. Try to find those papers. This can help you a lot with your experimentation. So then you may want to change and adapt the architecture to your problem. If you change something, find good reasons why this is an appropriate change. There are quite a few papers out there that seem to introduce random changes into the architecture. Later it turns out that the observations that they made were essentially random and they were just lucky or experimented enough on their own data in order to get the improvements. Typically there's also a reasonable argument of why the specific change should give an improvement in performance. Next, you want to do your hyperparameter search. So you remember learning rate decay, regularization dropout and so on. These have to be tuned. Still the networks can take days or weeks to train and you have to search for these hyperparameters. Hence, we recommend using a log scale. So for example, for EDA you go for 0 0.1, 0 0.01 and 0.001. You may want to consider a grid search or random search. In a grid search you would have equal distance steps and if you look at reference 2 they have shown that a random search has advantages over the grid search. First of all it's easier to implement and second it has a better exploration of the parameters and this may have a strong influence. So you may want to look into that and then adjust your strategy accordingly. So hyperparameters are highly interdependent. You may want to use a coarse to fine search. You optimize on a very coarse scale in the beginning and then you make it finer. You may also only train the network for a few epochs and then bring all the hyperparameters in a sensible range. Then you can refine using random and grid search. So hyperparameters are highly interdependent and you may want to use a coarse to fine search. You optimize on a very coarse scale in the beginning and then make it finer. You may also only train the network for a few epochs and then bring all the hyperparameters in a sensible range. Then you can refine using random and grid search. A very common technique that can give you a little bit of boost of performance is ensembling. This is also something that can really help you to get this additional little bit of performance that you still need. So far we have only considered a single classifier. Ensembling has the idea to use many of those classifiers. 
if we assume n classifiers that are independent, performing a correct prediction will be at a probability of 1 minus p. Now the probability of seeing k errors is n choose k times p to the power of k times 1 minus p to the power of n minus k. This is a binomial distribution. So the probability of a majority meaning k greater than n over 2 to be wrong is the sum over n choose k times p to the power of k times 1 minus p to the power of n minus k. So we visualize this in the following plot here. In this graph you can see that if I take more of those weak classifiers we get stronger. Let's set, for example, their probability of being wrong to 0.42. Now we can compute this binomial distribution. Here you can see that if I choose 20, I get a probability of approximately 14% that the majority is wrong. If I choose n equals 32, I get less than 10% probability that the majority is wrong. If I choose 70, in more than 95% of the cases, the majority will be correct. So you see that this probability is monotonically decreasing for large n. If n approaches infinity, then the accuracy will go towards 1. It's over 9,000! The big problem here is, of course, the independence. So typically, we have problems generating from the same data independent classifiers. So if we had, of course, enough data, then we can train many of those independent weak classifiers. I'm optimistic about what can happen just with more computation and more data. So how do we then implement this concept? We somehow have to produce n independent classifiers or regressors, and then we combine the predictors by majority or averaging. How can we actually produce such components? Well, you can choose different models. So in the example here, we have seen that we have a non-convex function. Obviously, this has different local minima. So the different local minima would result in different models. Then we can try to combine them. Also, what you can try is a cyclic learning rate, where you then go up and down with the learning rate in order to escape certain local minima. This way you can then try to find local minima and store them for ensembling. Furthermore, you could also take different model checkpoints that you extract at different points in the optimization. Later, you can reuse them for ensembling. Also, a moving average of weights can generate new models. You could even go this far and combine different methods. So we still have the entire catalog of traditional machine learning approaches that you could also train and then combine with your new deep learning model. Typically, this is an easy boost of performance if you just need a little bit more. By the way, this was also the idea that finally helped to break the Netflix challenge. The first two teams were almost about to break the challenge so they teamed up and trained an ensemble. This way, they broke the challenge together. Next time in Deep Learning, we will talk about class imbalance, a very frequent problem, and how to deal with that in your training procedure. So, thank you very much for listening, and looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye-bye.